Welcome to Australia's Future with Tony Abbott. I'm Daniel Wilde from the Institute of Public Affairs. Australia is facing its most significant challenges since World War II. Geopolitical tensions are increasing. Cultural self-confidence is in decline. The values which define us, freedom, democracy, egalitarianism and sacrifice are being put to the test. Over this special podcast series, Tony and I discuss how Australia can survive and flourish in the decades ahead. Tony Abbott, Happy New Year. Great to be with you again. Looking forward to a big uh, 2023. And uh, thank you again for agreeing to do another season of Australia's Future with Tony Abbott. Uh, As people will see, uh, we are not only going to have listeners, but we're also going to have viewers this year. This will be the first videoed version of our uh, discussions, and that's based on uh, listener feedback that they like to see us. Um, so here we are, and there'll be further developments uh, to our format as the season goes on, which I'm very excited about. Um, I reckon, Tony, as always, we get straight into it, and today we're going to be talking about a range of things, the voice to parliament, censorship, um, and Australia Day. And to begin with, I thought we could discuss uh, an ABC story which ran on the 7:30 report last night about the voice to parliament. As you might have mentioned, it was uh, you might uh, expect it was very biased and very inaccurate. It was essentially targeting yourself uh, and our very good friends at Advance Australia, uh, who are doing a fantastic job on so many issues. In a nutshell, the story characterised. Um, the no campaign as uh, being misleading and divisive. Um, there was a lack of factual information to support this claim. But uh, Tony, you are a distinguished fellow here at the IPA. You're also on the advisory council of um, Advance uh, Australia. So to begin with, I just thought uh, if you wanted to respond to that or had any initial observations about the nature of the reporting on this matter. I thought it was a typical ABC hatchet job on a conservative organisation and a conservative uh, cause. And this, regrettably, is what we've come to expect from our ABC, which uh, really uh, is campaigning for the Green Left pretty much constantly. Now, uh, the problem with what happened to those Advance Australia uh, advertisements, if you like, about The Voice, is that they were censored, at least for a period, by, uh, by big tech, on the basis of a critique from the RMIT, which uh, I think simply doesn't stand up. In fact, uh, the Advance Australia advertisement said that The Voice would give special rights to some that were not available to all. Um, And I think it's self-evidently true that that is exactly what The Voice is. Uh, It is uh, an advisory group to the parliament, uh, which even the Prime Minister concedes will have a virtual veto power over what the parliament and the government does, Mm. uh, which is constituting, if you like, uh, not a voice to government uh, from all Australians, but a voice to government by some Australians over what government does for all Australians. And I think that is certainly special rights for some and not for all. So so I think this was another example of... uh, Uh, Woke Australia doing its best uh, to ensure uh, that the uh, critique of the voice is uh, not only out-argued but even unheard, and and I just think that's wrong. Uh, We've also got the situation where uh, the supporters of a voice are getting tax deductibility from the Albanese government, and there's uh, no sign that there will be tax deductibility for donations made to opponents of The Voice. And if we're going to have a level playing field for this very important discussion about our constitutional and governmental future, obviously both sides of the argument have got to have the same opportunity. Um, So the government has said, A, there'll be no official yes and no case posted to every household, as has always previously been the case for every other referendum we've had. Uh, It said that it's not going to give any funding to either side uh, in the expectation that the yes case will be well-funded by woke billionaires and woke public companies. Um, uh, And now it's giving tax deductibility to one side but not the other and you've got big tech chiming in with the sort of censorship that we've seen. So I think this whole debate 
is at risk of being tainted by dreadful unfairness, and I just think that's wrong, and I think that Australians deserve better than a one-sided debate about something as important as this. Are you worried that the fix is in on this? Are you worried that this is being rigged, that there's going to be a complete lack of openness and transparency? I don't think that the vote itself will be rigged. I but have the debate no, more generally. I, ha- I have no reason to think that uh, the vote won't be um, as fair as votes in Australia always are. But I certainly think that there is an attempt to uh, uh, to shut down and to minimise one side of the argument. And again, I just think that's wrong. And my hope is that Australians' traditional fair-mindedness uh, and desire uh, to give the underdog a go um, might actually, in the end, rebound uh, against the government and the proponents of the voice in this case. You mentioned a moment ago the uh, RMIT fact, or well, they call it the RMIT fact lab, which is sort of their so-called fact-checking unit. RMIT is a university which is um, uh, based here in Melbourne. And they had a lady on there, uh, Sushi Das, who's the assistant director of the RMIT fact lab, and she was interviewed on this uh, ABC News story. And I want to put to you the uh, quote, a couple of quotes from her and the context for it, and then get your response. So she starts off by saying, this is Sushi Das, Assistant Director of RMIT Fact Lab, quote, a referendum in any country is a very important moment. It's really important there is accurate information out there, accurate information, and the ability for people to make informed decisions bolsters our democracy, end quote. So far, so good. I think we all agree with that. Then there's a narrator from the story saying, RMIT Fact Lab has partnered with Facebook's parent company, Meta, to flag misinformation on the company's platforms. And this is what Sushi Das then says, quote, once we've rated something as false, we publish publish the fact check on the RMIT Fact Lab website and Meta, which is the Facebook company, using using its technology can either gray out the post, downgrade the post, or attach a warning to the post and allow users to be directed to the actual fact check article. End quote. Tony, this is deeply concerning. You have a taxpayer funded university working with big tech to censor the no case, and they're bragging about it. They're open about it. They're not ashamed of it. How concerned are you about this censorship? Well, I think we should all be quite worried about the propensity of big tech uh, to control not just what we say, but even what we're allowed to think. And I think this is a classic illustration of the power of big tech and the potential danger that it poses. Now, originally, um, all these platforms, Twitter, Facebook, etc., said that they're not publishers, they're platforms. Mm. Uh, and that was why they shouldn't be controlled by government. Uh, but once they start to say that they will publish this but not that, they're not, uh, they're not platforms, they're publishers and therefore um, they have to be treated, I think, uh, I think quite differently. So, look, it's really not up to uh, the RMIT uh, to make a highly contentious judgment uh, about a particular argument and then connive with big tech uh, to cancel Mm. these things, and that's precisely what we've seen. Now, um, there is so much that's wrong with this this voice. Uh, It's wrong in principle to divide Australians by race. It's wrong in principle to enshrine race in our constitution. I think it's it's wrong in practice, bad in practice, uh, to make our governmental processes even more gummed up than they are. I don't think it makes any sense at all and it won't enhance our national unity uh, to have what I suspect will be a race-based electoral role um, uh, uh, so that only a a certain type of Australian or a certain category of Australian can vote for a body on which only certain categories of Australians are allowed uh, to sit. Um, If we're going to have a voice for one group, well, what about all the other identities Mm. uh, in our country today, why shouldn't they have a special voice? So I think there's just so much wrong with this. Um, But I should also make the point while we're on it, Dan, I'm certainly not against recognising Indigenous people in the Constitution. Um, I'm in favour of 
suitable recognition for Indigenous people in the Constitution. But this is so much more than recognition. Uh, this is so much more than just showing suitable respect to the first Australians. This is a very substantial change to the way we governed. Uh, and it is something which I think is wildly at odds with the goal, with the ideal that we have been working towards for hundreds of years, and that is um, to treat everyone equally, mm. regardless of their race, their, ethni their ethnicity, their cultural background, their gender, their religion, whatever. Mm. Um, every human being has the same inherent rights, should be treated with the same inherent respect, and we shouldn't give anyone uh, advantages over another on the basis of a characteristic like race or colour or creed or gender. Uh, that's why I think this is such a regressive proposal. And I think the way you've just put it there very nicely is exactly why they're trying to censor the no case, because mm. if Australians hear that argument... Mm. As you say, they're fair-minded people and they'll say, well, this is not fair. Mm. It's not right. We all want to help Indigenous Australians. And I've never met anyone that doesn't feel bad and think it's an absolute tragedy of what's happening in remote communities, but this is not the way to do it. Not the way to do it. And the idea that somehow the difficulties of remote Australia will be resolved by yet another talk fest in Canberra, uh, yet another activist conclave, more politicians uh, is, com is completely is completely improbable. Um, look, there's no lack of consultation with Aboriginal people. Uh, there, there's no lack of opportunities for Aboriginal people to be heard. Mm. We already have eleven individual Indigenous voices in our national parliament, and each one of those individual Indigenous people uh, were chosen by their fellow Australians on the basis of what they thought was their general suitability for public life, uh, which is as it should be, uh, not on the basis of falling into a special category or special class of people. So, so, so this idea that somehow we will better resolve the difficulties that indiv Indigenous people face uh, through yet another committee, through yet another process, it's just wrong. Uh, I think it's crystal clear what we need to do uh, we need to get the kids to school, we need to get the adults to work, and we need to keep the community safe. Um, why this isn't happening, I think, is a, a lack of conviction on the part of too many people in authority and this lingering sense that Indigenous people have got to be treated separately in important respects from everyone else. And the voice is going to add... Uh, to that uh, mm. uh, separatism, uh, not detract from it. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I, I, I can't think of a more important issue before our country at the moment, and I can't think of a proposal which is which has the potential to do more damage uh, if it succeeds. Well, Tony, I have to say you're, you're speaking a lot like a former member of parliament and a former prime minister, and dare I say maybe a future Member of Parliament uh, once again, uh, which uh, relates, of course, as you know, to comments made earlier this week. I think it was started off by Michael Kroger on Sky News and then reported in The Australian that uh, perhaps you might have a go at running for the Senate um, in New South Wales following the, uh, the very sad passing of uh, Jim Molan. Uh, Michael Kroger said that there's no one better than Tony Abbott, that Tony Abbott was uh, one of our greatest uh, opposition leaders that there's so much to offer and um, essentially that we need people like Tony back in Parliament to help the centre-right get out of the morass that it's in. Uh, so, Tony, when can we expect to see you back uh, in Canberra? Well, <laughs> in a sense, it's flattering that uh, some people think I would have something to add. Um, I should say at the outset, uh, Dan, that um, Jim Molan was a wonderful Australian, a very good friend of mine, and the last thing I want to do is to disrespect his memory uh, by uh, speculating over his former Senate position. Uh, that's the last thing I want to do. So, so look, these are observations directed not to any particular 
position, but just to the general notion uh, of of a possible return to Parliament. I, I should start out by saying, Dan, that I loved and appreciated every moment of my time in the Parliament. But things do move on, mm. and for the last four years, I've been doing my best uh, to be useful outside the parliament, and I think I've succeeded reasonably well. Uh, there are a lot of things that I'm able to do outside the parliament that I wouldn't be able to do inside the parliament. For instance, were I inside the parliament uh, uh, as a member of the coalition party room, uh, I wouldn't be able to speak as openly as I currently can uh, about things like the Indigenous voice because the coalition has not yet come to a, uh, a joint conclusion uh, on this. I wouldn't be able to speak as freely as I currently can on energy policy, for instance, because again, uh, the coalition is uh, is is uh, deeply committed to a net zero position. And while all of us would like at some point uh, to get to net zero, I certainly don't think we should be ideological uh, about or dogmatic about the date. So, so I can do lots of things outside the parliament uh, that I couldn't do in the parliament. Um, I also think that as a former prime minister and party leader, you have uh, responsibilities and duties over and above those which uh, just any old party member mm. might have, uh, even another former member of parliament might have. Uh, the last thing I want to do is uh, be difficult, make difficulties for Peter Dutton who's a friend of mine. I admire him very much and I think he's doing a good job. Um, I think the only way uh, an ex-party leader could go back is if there was an overwhelming demand for it. And uh, uh, these, th this is not unknown, but it's extremely rare. So um, much as I'm flattered to be thought of by at least some people in this way, <laughs> it's not something that I would count on seeing anytime soon, if at all. Well, I'd suggest there probably is an overwhelming demand. There's, you know, maybe a minority of those in the elite circles mm -hmm. that um, understand how powerful you can be in political circles, mm -hmm. and for that reason, don't want you to be there. But mm -hmm. um, I might just ask one other question here, then I'll I'll, I'll leave it. But what about the uh, the, the lower house? Uh, there's if there's opportunities to go into a lower house seat, whether there's a vacancy, you know, the seat of Cook if that were to become vacant or whether you were to try to take on, uh, say, a Chris Bowen uh, in the outer western suburbs of Sydney where you're very popular, um, that seems, you know, at a minimum perspective. What's your thoughts? Well, again, Daniel, I think I have got to be first and foremost uh, a servant of the party and it would depend very much on what the party wanted and the last thing I would want to do uh, – is 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 do something in a way which was highly contentious inside the party. I think if I were to do anything uh, for and with the party, it ought to be something that has overwhelming support. Now, um, what I've been doing in my post-parliamentary time is uh, I've been uh, helping uh, candidates and MPs who would like my help to campaign. Uh, I've certainly been attending uh, where uh, invited uh, and relishing in attending uh, Liberal Party events and doing my best to remind people of our deep principles and philosophies. Uh, I've been doing my best to encourage Australians who normally vote Liberal and regard themselves as uh, supporters of our party to actually join the party mm. and get involved. So. I'm doing my best to be helpful and, as I said, the last thing I would like to do, uh, given that I am a contentious figure in the wider community, uh, is be contentious inside the Liberal Party itself. Well, fair enough. And I'd add to that that you've also certainly been a thought leader uh, in terms of providing direction for the centre-right, which um, we're basically looking at wall-to-wall -wall Labor governments on the mainland shortly, uh, if the polls are anything to go by uh, in, in New South Wales. So that thought leadership is is critical. And I thought we'd just turn to our, our last topic today on which uh, every year as Australia Day approaches, unfortunately now in a way that it hasn't been in the past, it's considered contentious. 
uh, to celebrate Australia Day on the 26th of January. You have the usual noisy inner city elites and the media and the big corporates and uh, big tech that are, uh, they say they want to change the date, but they don't want to change the date. They want to cancel the day. And that's the problem we have here. Look, my view, very simply, and it won't surprise you, is 26th of January every year is Australia Day. It's the day where we all come together to celebrate our nation, how far we've come. Where else on earth would you want to be than here? We're not perfect, but we're pretty good. And uh, we should have that day as a special day for all of us. And I'm, as many Australians are, a sick and tired of the division. Um, but here we are again. Tony, what's your thoughts about Australia Day and the broader debate that it's, that's taking place? Dan, uh, the 26th of January, 1788, uh, was uh, effectively the day modern Australia began. It was the day when uh, modernity came to an ancient continent. Uh, and yes, uh, it was the beginning of uh, serious disruption and dispossession uh, to the Indigenous people, but it was also the beginning uh, of the rule of law, uh, of representative government, uh, of respect for individual rights, um, all of which have turned out to mark Australia, uh, characterise Australia in a way which is remarkable mm. uh, by global standards. Um, I think the important thing to note uh, here, Dan, is that uh, no country on earth has anything like as high a proportion of its people born overseas. Um, over a quarter of our population were born overseas. Now, not a single one of those migrants were forced to come. They all came here uh, because they chose to come. And this idea that Australia is somehow illegitimate, this idea that Australia is somehow uh, racist, is completely overturned, completely contradicted by the fact that so many people um, have chosen to come here. They've voted with their feet for Australia. And certainly uh, over the last quarter century, uh, a substantial majority of those people have been from Asia. Mm. Now, why would migrants choose our country other than uh, through a conviction that whatever blemishes we might have, we are overwhelmingly preferable mm. uh, to their homeland? I mean, it's a huge move to disrupt your life, uh, leave your familiar surroundings and go to a faraway country, mm. and yet millions of people do it. Uh, many millions more would like to do it. Uh, that surely is the greatest tribute to our country that we can have. And given the percentage of migrants that we have, it's a greater tribute that's paid to our country than is paid to any other country. So um, this is certainly a country worth celebrating, absolutely a country worth celebrating, respecting, honouring, and um, by far the most appropriate day to do that uh, is the day when we were founded uh, as a modern society or a day when we began as a modern society, and that's the 26th of January. So look, um, I'm all for keeping the date. Uh, I think, as you say, the people who want to change the date um, are not so much uh, being uh, oversensitive uh, to the anxieties of uh, some Indigenous people. I think, by and large, uh, their larger project is not to change the date but to change the country. And yes. I think they want to change the country for the worse. I think you're quite right. Um, I just wanted to ask you about this latest sort of development by these big woke corporations who – clearly don't uh, share our views on Australia. And uh, I think in the past you've said that some, you know, whether it's big business or other members of the elite in this country need to get on Team Australia mm -hmm. and back us in, uh, where they're basically removing, that they're allowing their employees to come in and work on Australia Day. In, in, in essence, removing it being a public holiday. Um, I just see this as, a part of a much bigger and broader campaign by big business to, as I say, cancel Australia Day and doing it now because it's not popular. 
um, they're doing it by stealth. What's your views on that particular issue? Well, again, uh, I, I, I just think that it's uh, politically correct posturing by companies that would be better advised focusing on providing better goods and services, uh, providing more effective competition, providing lower prices to customers and uh, delivering higher wages to their staff. I think that's what business should be doing. Mm. Um, it should be focusing uh, on its job, which is to provide goods and services at a reasonable price, uh, at high quality uh, to its customers and to do the right thing uh, by its customers, its staff and its shareholders. That's that's business's job. Um, not to second guess our political leaders, uh, not to make grandiose and sweeping cultural statements, um, not to virtue signal. Mm. Uh, and yet uh, all too often, whether it's big business or big sport, uh, these days we've got, uh, I think, uh, virtue signalling on topics where uh, they they have no particular expertise um, and which are indeed a distraction from the things where they, they are experts. So, so I'm disappointed by it. I guess in a free country um, it shouldn't be stopped, uh, but I wish more people would think better of it. Mm. Well, Tony, I think you're, you're quite right and I would say however you know, you're celebrating Australia Day or myself and the viewers, uh, we should say happy Australia Day to, to everybody and um, it's an important reminder to me that we do have a great country and as I say, I think we're all going to be better off if we have a day where we pause and we just say we're very lucky. Exactly right. Um, personally and collectively, I think we should spend more time counting our blessings um, I know <laughs> sometimes you've got to dwell on your faults in order to improve, uh, but uh, at least as, one day you get away. As with as, as, as Australians, uh, we've all won the lottery of life, and we should be grateful. Indeed. Well, Tony, on that note, I think we'll draw it to a close. So, thank you very much for our first chat of uh, 2023, uh, our first video chat, and looking forward to many more throughout the year. Me too, Dan. This is a production of the Centre for the Australian Way of Life at the Institute of Public Affairs. To find out more, visit australia.ipa.org.au.